Uh, welcome to uh, Introducing Coordinate Systems and Transformations talk. Um, my name is Rob. My name is Rob Jurgens. This is uh, Oyan Shawrich. We're both developers on the projection engine team at Esri. We also have with us Melita Kennedy, who is also on the team. And uh, uh, after the talk, all three of us will be available for questions if you have any. Okay, so a typical problem that we have is where the heck is my data? And so I'm going to turn this over to Bolyan, and he's going to describe the problem. So um, here I have an orthophoto image of Palm Springs area, and I would like to map a Palm Springs town border. So <coughs> if I add the layer with the Palm Springs, the layer doesn't show up on the map. So if I zoom to the layer, I see that basically layer is actually drawn on the map but basically data just doesn't line up. Um, so let's take a look, like if I do the full uh, world view, I can see that the blue, here the blue um, mark basically shows the area of Palm Springs, but our polygon is located here in the middle of the ocean. So when we have something like that as an issue and data doesn't line up, usually there is a problem with coordinate systems or Usually, it's a problem with the coordinate system. So to better understand that, we have to know details about coordinate system so that we can fix the problem. And for that, Rob is going to explain us all the details. All right, so we're going to be discussing four different things. Horizontal and vertical coordinate systems, projections, and transformations, all in one hour. Start with horizontal coordinate systems. So what does a coordinate system tell us? It can tell us distance, location, or direction. For example, how far is it from San Francisco to Los Angeles? Well, we can say it's 352 miles. We can say it's 690 kilometers. We can say other values. It all depends on what coordinate system you're using. Same with, we're looking at location. We can say we're at minus 118.34 or we're at 1276. Different values, it all, again, depends on the coordinate system. <clears throat> Same with direction. North Pole might be up, it might be down, it might be to the right. It might not even be in a map. It all depends on the coordinate system. So there are two kinds of horizontal coordinate systems, geographic and projected. The geographic coordinate system is based on a spheroidal surface. We are looking at essentially the surface of a globe. And we measure points with latitude and longitude. Um, <clears throat> this globe is a spheroid, not necessarily a perfect sphere. It might be flattened. Uh, <clears throat> in this case, we can see that we are looking at a flattened uh, globe because we can see that the point going normal to the surface of the Earth does not hit the center of the Earth. This is what happens when you're dealing with an ellipsoid, essentially, as opposed to a perfect sphere. But we can still identify points with latitude and longitude. Normally, we measure in degrees, but there could be other values. Here's the same point. This is, uh, a lot of people are confused because we can show this in ArcMap or ArcPro. Um, but really, all we're showing is just the degrees. Minus 90 to plus 90, minus 180 to plus 180. This is not a projection. This is simply showing degrees in a flat square. Now, in a projected coordinate system, <clears throat> we're dealing with a flat map. And the measurements on this map are linear values. They're like meters or yards or feet. 
measure from a particular um, origin. <clears throat> so we have the geographic, which is on, on the surface of a globe, versus projected, where we are converting the uh, globe values to flat map values. So what is in a horizontal coordinate system? Okay, in a geographic coordinate system, we have a prime meridian, which is where we are measuring longitude from. Latitudes are measured from the equator, but longitudes are measured from an arbitrary point on the Earth, normally Greenwich. We have an angular unit, usually degrees, but it might be grads, it might be radians. We have a datum, which contains a spheroid, and the spheroid describes the shape of the Earth. Is it a true sphere? Is it an ellipsoid? What is the flattening for the ellipsoid? Uh, we'll talk about datums later. Now, in a projected coordinate system, <clears throat> A projected coordinate system is always based on a particular geographic coordinate system. And then it contains a projection. The pro a projection is the mathematical algorithm that is used to convert between the degrees and the xy's. And each, al e each mathematical algorithm has its particular parameters, and they're different for the various different projections. And then we have a linear unit. Are we dealing with meters, yards, feet, etc.? So there are two ways that we can specify a coordinate system, either by well-known ID or by well-known text. Okay. All predefined coordinate systems have a particular well-known ID. As we can see here, we have the famous WGS 1984, and it has an ID of 4326. Um, if the ID is less than 32766, less than or equal, I should say, to 32767, then this ID is assigned by the EPSG, the European Survey Petroleum Group, which is used as a standard for, by a lot of different software companies. If the ID is greater than that, then it is assigned by ESRI. In this case, we can see, for instance, the ID here is 102.299, so we know immediately that this is an ESRI-assigned number. It's not an EPSG number. Now, WKIDs may change. There's a number of reasons for this. The first one is quite often <clears throat> a authority, some country or whatever, might come to us, to ESRI, and say, can you add this particular coordinate system to your database? So we'll do that. And when we add to our database, we assign it an ESRI number. Then what happens is later on, EPSG adds it to their database, and they're going to give it their number. So then we have to then, what we do is we change our number to match their number. We mark it as what we call a code change. In our software, in this situation, either one will work. For instance, we can see here, we're looking for 102.100, but we're actually, you know, which is an ESRI number, but we're actually getting 3857, which is the EPSG number. Now, in a well-known text, this is, this is a string representation of a coordinate system, and it is the only way that you can specify a custom, essentially a non-predefined coordinate system. So in this case, we're looking at a well-known text for a geographic coordinate system, and we see that we have a name for the coordinate system. We have a datum, which has a name. We have a spheroid, and then we have two values with the spheroid, which is the uh, axis and the uh, flattening value. 
these two things tell us the size and shape of the uh, globe that we're working with. And then a prime meridian, which will usually be Greenwich. And then a unit value. Notice the, the weird number is the conversion value between degrees and radians. Because internally, all of our software, you know, all of our math is all done in radians. In a projected coordinate system, we can see that it is based on an underlying geographic coordinate system. So here's the same coordinate system, the geographic, as part of the projected coordinate system. We also have a name, and then we have the name of the projection, which in this case, again, is the name of the particular mathematical algorithm that we're using, then whatever parameters are appropriate to that algorithm, and then finally, a unit value, meters or feet or whatever. Again, for, unit, for linear unit values, it's the conversion to meters. For angular units, it's always the conversion to radians. Well, that's horizontal coordinate systems. Now we get to deal with vertical coordinate systems. For example, how high is Mount Everest? Well, we can say it's 8844 meters. We can say it's 29029 feet, etc. Again, it depends on the vertical coordinate system that we are using. So a vertical coordinate system <clears throat> defines the origin for either the height or the depth from a standard value. Um, sometimes we're dealing with heights. Um, when we're dealing in oceanography, uh, for instance, then we're dealing with depths. So there's two kinds. One is the geometric model. A geometric model is based on the ellipsoid. This is a mathematical you know, construct which describes what we think is the, you know, the shape of the, uh, of the globe. It is mathematical. And if we're dealing with a gravity-related model, for instance, a geoid, <clears throat> what we are dealing here with is a lumpy, bumpy surface. This is a physical model, not a theoretical mathematical model. This is a physical model, which is usually based on whatever is the gravitational leveling of, of the Earth. So here's an example of, of a geoid. This is uh, the Earth expanded 12,500 times to kind of uh, show you how the Earth is really very lumpy and bumpy. So, in a gravity-related Earth model, uh, very often we, we use the term a geoid, we are dealing with, we have the blue line here, which is, again, our theoretical ellipsoid. This is the mathematical ellipsoid that we might be using. We also have the green line here, which is the lumpy, bumpy physical model. And then we have a difference between them, which is usually called the undulation. This is a difference between the ellipsoid value and the geoid value. So what do we do with this? Let's see. In a vertical coordinate system, what do we have? We have either a datum or a vertical datum. Datum is in the case of an ellipsoid, and vertical datum is in the case of a gravity-related model. We have a vertical shift value, which is just some arbitrary value that you can add to anything, to any value, to shift its thing. We have a direction. Are we going up? or are we going down? And then finally, we have a linear unit, usually meters, but it could be feet, yards, et cetera. Well, let's look at this, datum versus vertical datum. If it's a datum, 
then it is based on the ellipsoid. It is based on the theoretical mathematical ellipsoid. And we are dealing then with, we are dealing with what we call little h, which is the height between our value and, and the ellipsoid. In a vertical datum, which is the gravity related, we are looking at the difference between, you know, we use capital H to indicate this, and again, it is the difference, but it's the difference between our physical model and our point, as opposed to our theoretical ellipsoidal model. Direction and shift. Um, direction is either positive when we're dealing with height values, or it's negative if we're dealing with depth values. The vertical shift is just an arbitrary offset that you can specify um, in uh, all predefined vertical coordinate systems have no vertical shift. This is for users to use. Again, <clears throat> we can use well-known IDs or a well-known text to describe a vertical coordinate system. Again, we see here we have a, the keyword vert CS, its name. In this case, it's a V datum, so we know that this is a gravity related one as opposed to an ellipsoidal, otherwise it would say datum and have a underlying spheroid. And we have a couple of parameters and the unit, or we can specify it by well-known ID. And again, the same rules apply for well-known IDs for vertical as well as horizontal coordinate systems. <clears throat> um, you can, if you have arbitrary data and you can essentially assign what coordinate system you are using for that data, this is done by using the define project tool. And we're showing it both in, in uh, uh, ArcGIS, uh, ArcMap, and ArcGIS Pro, and also the way you could use it directly in our Python. We do have code. So you can say, yeah, they showed code. So this, the defined project tool, does not change your data. It only describes what is the coordinate system that we are thinking that your data is in. It doesn't do any change to it. So, <clears throat> projections. What are we talking about when we say we are doing a projection? Okay, a projection is an algorithm that converts between a globe, you know, degrees, latitude, longitude, to a flat map, x, y. We're going from a round globe to a flat map. That's what a projection does. And as you can see, we have a lot of different projections. Here's a list of them. We have like um, 70, 80 different projections that we support. And we're adding more all the time, right? You know, all the time. Yes. So why are there so many projections? Well, if you think about it, let's take an orange and you peel off, you know, you remove the peel and you try to flatten it down. Well, it doesn't end up flat. It ends up bumpy. Um, something in a projection has to be distorted. Okay, usually it's either the shape might distort, the area might distort, the direction or the distance. So remember, you're SAD, S-A-D-D, -D, shape, area, direction, distance. So, for example, let's look at this. This is a typical web mercator, which everybody uses. <clears throat> you look at this map, and you say, well, which is bigger? Well, obviously, Antarctica is huge. And then we have Greenland, and then we finally have South America, which is the smallest. But actually, we can see that 
South America is 17,000 square kilometers, whereas Antarctica is only 14,000, and Greenland is very small. Let's look, look, for instance, here in a web Mercator, if you compare what Greenland looks like to what Africa looks like, they look approximately the same size. But in actuality, Greenland is much, much smaller. So we can see that this Mercator projection is not preserving size or area. It, it is, or, you know, it is distorting that value. So which projection is the best? Well, it depends on what you want to do. If you're, for instance, dealing with rainfall or area, you know, crop stuff, you would be probably most interested in preserving your area. If you're flying an airplane, you might be more interested in preserving direction. So let's look at that. For instance, we can preserve area. For instance, an Albers equal area. Um, it looks kind of strange, but the areas are preserved. For instance, we can see that America, United States, I should say, and, and Australia are approximately the same size. So we are showing the same area, but Australia, the shape of Australia, is greatly distorted. Okay, but the areas displayed are the same. Again, we might want to preserve angles, which usually only works at a small scale. Um, <clears throat> uh, we might want to preserve direction and distance, for instance, which again, even, even a map that a, even a projection that, that preserves direction and distance, again, will only really be accurate when you're measuring from the center of the map. So you have to center the map to, you know, on where you're starting from to really get accurate. So <clears throat> um, we have a tool called the project tool, and this is what is used to convert your data from one coordinate system to another. The project tool can either convert between a geographic coordinate system to a projected or a projected to a geographic, or it could convert between two projected or two geographic, depending on whatever it is you want to do. And here we're showing, you know, it's in the toolboxes, you'll go to geoprocessing, uh, projection transformations, project, you can specify what the information is, or you can do it directly from Python. So what do we mean when we say we are projecting data, or when we are converting between coordinate systems? So in this case, we want to go between one projected coordinate system to another projected coordinate system. And they are both based on the same underlying geographic coordinate system. So we never go directly. We always go, we unproject down to the geographic coordinate system, and then we reproject it back up to the second coordinate system. We never go straight across. We always go down to the geographic and then back up to the other projected coordinate system. Now, in a situation where we're going between two coordinate systems and they, have, they are both based on a different underlying geographic coordinate system, then, again, we unproject down to the geographic. Then we do a geographic or data transformation to the other geographic coordinate system and then we reproject it back up again. So it's a three-step process. Unproject, transform, and reproject. So what do we mean when we say transformations? What are we actually doing here? Okay, let's look at this. <clears throat> Normally, we are originally starting with 
this yellow line, which is the mathematical ellipsoid that we are dealing with. This is, the, it's theoretical. For instance, if we're dealing with WGS84, we're dealing with an ellipsoid that somewhat uh, models the Earth's surface as we know it. But our data might be in some particular location, which is either above or below this theoretical ellipsoid. Think of the theoretical ellipsoid as being essentially sea level. So if you're at some, like in Denver, where you're a mile up, the shape of the Earth is different at that location than you are at sea level. So what we do is we try to figure out a different ellipsoid where the, where the shape of that ellipsoid matches the surface of the Earth where your data is. So this is very data location specific. Depending on where you are, you're going to have a different ellipsoid because we're trying to match what is the shape of the, of the Earth's surface at that particular location. So moving from our theoretical ellipsoid, the dotted line, to our, uh, to our better ellipsoid that fits the Earth, this is what we're doing when we say we're doing a datum or a, or a horizontal transformation. Now, why is this important? Well, let's look at this. Here we have... <clears throat> a raster image, which is in ED 1950. This is in Europe. And then we have a, you know, this is showing some arbitrary, you know, location. And then we have a WGS 84 layer, which is showing a road. Now you can see that the, that the road does not match where the road really is. So what we have to do is we have to transform our WGS84 layer to match the ED50 layer. So it, when we do that transformation, then we see that it lines up. So a datum transformation, <clears throat> well, you know, or horizontal transformation, is typically a shift on the order of meters to maybe hundreds of meters. It is important when you are zoomed in and looking at, at data. If you're like looking at a world, for instance, it's not so important because when you're looking at the entire world map, you're not going to be able to see 100 meters or 10 meters difference. So the, the more you zoom in, the more it is important that you, that you do this transformation. So there's two kinds of transformations. We can either do a geographic or datum transformation, or we can do a vertical transformation. Geographic transformations are defined as going in a particular direction from a given geographic coordinate system to another geographic coordinate system. They're defined in, as transforming in a particular direction but they are all reversible. You can go backwards. You can go back and forth between them. Now, they are defined for a particular area, as we talked about. Depending on where you are, we want, we're dealing with a particular surface that matches the Earth at that point. So even here, where we're going between NAD27 and WGS84, for North America, we see that there are 33 different transformations. <clears throat> and they are all centered for a particular area. What you want is you want to look at the various areas, look at your data, and what you, what you want to do is, if possible, is to pick the smallest rectangle that includes all of your data, because the, the smaller the area of your transformation, 
then the more accurate that shape is going to be. If your shape is, is for the entire North America, it's not going to be as accurate as if you're dealing with just Alaska or just Puerto Rico or something like that. So how do you pick between all of these? Well, we have various ways of doing it. This is the way you would do it. Uh, <clears throat> One of these is the way ArcMap does it, the other one is the way ArcGIS Pro does it. What we, are, what we do is we look at the various, you know, at your, uh, the two geographic coordinate systems. Now remember, a geographic coordinate system is defined for a particular area. So we're going from one area to another area. Transformations are defined as being good for a particular area. And then we have your data. Where is your data located? So based on all of this information, we come up with a list of all of the various transformations that could theoretically work. Now, unless you know particular information, you should always just pick the top entry in the list. This is, the, you know, this is sorted by what we think is the best transformation for you to use based on, on, on how much area coverage you have, what is the accuracy of the various transformations, um, et cetera. So unless you know better, um, always just pick the top entry in the list. So in a vertical transformation, which you would do in the project tool, for instance, you would check the vertical box, which says I not only want to do geographic transformations on my data, but I also want to do vertical transformations. So what we are, usually what we're doing is we're going between an ellipsoidal height, which again, remember, is the height based on our theoretical ellipsoid and an orthometric or, or gravity-based height, which is based on our lumpy, bumpy geoid. <clears throat> so a vertical transformation, we are basically going between a source vertical coordinate system and a target coordinate system. Now, there may be a geographic coordinate system associated with this, and there may not be. The reason for this is, is that since typically we're dealing with physical data, okay, you can't just mathematically describe the way the data is. We have to have a, essentially, a grid file, which is actually giving us real values around whatever area we're dealing with. So when we, when we have a grid file, then we have to know, uh, we have to have a particular latitude and longitude for our values to be able to look up what is the vertical shift at that point. So for grid-based transformations, we will have a geographic coordinate system associated with it, which tells us how to look up the data in the grid file. Then there's a vertical transformation method uh, and its parameters. So there's two basic kinds of vertical transformations. We have geoid models, and here they're named. Um, these are the ones that are based on doing a grid lookup. Okay, so they're always going to have a grid file associated with them. And then we have a couple vertical offset or vertical offset and slope, which is just your essentially just doing a, a fixed change and you know, for, for all of your points and you don't need to have a grid associated with it. So <clears throat> the vertical transformation grid files are not part of the normal ArcMap or ArcGIS Pro installation. Um, because it's, you know, they're very large files. One of them is, uh, is almost 900 meg in size. So what you have to do is, if you want to 
use vertical transformations and you want to get these grid files, what you would do is you would log into my Esri, log in using your account, go to my organizations, go to downloads, and then data and content, and then you'll, you'll get this list for the various uh, data that you can that you can download. This download is approximately one and a half gigabytes in size. This is why we don't normally include it with our base you know, install. It includes some specific geographic coordinate systems and mostly uh, all of the vertical coordinate system data, all the grid files for the vertical coordinate system. So if you're doing vertical, you have to uh, download this. If you're doing horizontal, you may want to download this if um, if you end up needing one of the one of the newer geographic grid files, which are not in the base installation. So, uh, for more information about how all this works, we have a we have a talk this afternoon at. 2.30? Ah, there it is, in Demo Theater 3. So I highly recommend that you all attend that. Uh, Boyan and Melita will be giving that talk. So we've discussed coordinate systems, projecting, transforming, and now we can go back to dealing with our problem. Boyan? Yeah. OK. So. Let's first take a look uh, spatial reference for our orthophoto image. Uh, go here to properties, source, spatial reference. So we can see that the projected coordinate system uh, that the data is in is NAT um, 83 UTM zone uh, 11N, and it uses transverse Mercator projection. And of course, it has its own parameter. Geographic coordinate system here is North American 1983, uh, also using the same datum. So if you take a look at our layer of uh, po our polygon layer, and trying to find the spatial reference, oops, we can see that the spatial reference of that layer is unknown. So that's the reason, actually, why our map does not line up, our, our data doesn't line up. Um, so we have to kind of define the coordinate system to that. And if we take a look at the extent of the data, we can see that the data is, doesn't look like it is in meters or feet. It more looks like it is in degrees. Now, because I know the specification of the data, because I know where this data is coming from, I can as basically assume that the data is probably in WGC before. So I'm, you, with that, these kind of situations, you kind of have to make educated guess which uh, coordinate system you can use. In my case, I know that. So, uh, and because the values are looking like degrees and not meters, I know that this is probably a geographic coordinate system. To assign a coordinate system, as Rob told us, we can use define project tool. So I'm going to run that tool, specify the layer, and the coordinate system. I have it stored here in GCSW, GC84. And now, when I run the tool, as soon as the tool is completed, I can already see that the polygon lines up with our orthophoto image. Uh, orthophoto image is using a NAT83 geographic coordinate system, and our polygon is using a WGS84 coordinate system. So we also have to verify that we're using transformation so that the data is lined up correctly. We can check that in the map properties. If you go under the transformations, we can see here both coordinate, geographic coordinate systems that are used in our map, uh, as well as the map coordinate system that we have, and we can see that data from WGS84 is actually transformed to NAT83. If I click there here, 
I can get the list of all transformations I can use here. There's a lot of them, and you can pick yeah. whichever you want. Uh, but yeah, in general, the top one is probably the one the best. Um, therefore, it is selected here on the map. And that would be all on my side, Rob. OK. Um, for resources here, um, you can go to the uh, help in ArcMap or Ar ArcGIS Pro. Um, there, we have a book. I don't know if there's any left in the bookstore. Uh, Lining Up Data in ArcGIS by Margaret Mayer. I highly recommend this book. It is a great book. And then finally, there's a couple of technical papers that you can look at which describe this, this stuff. Please take our survey. Um, the more positive results we get from the survey, you know, controls whether or not we give this talk next year. Remember the the proper answer to all questions is five. <laughs> okay, uh, any questions? <clears throat> um, yes. When you're measuring this, the, the gravity data, which is usually in grid files, is actually, this is data that is produced by satellites that is measuring the, gravi the, the gravity surface of the Earth. And, of course, and the thing is, the gravitational surface of the Earth changes because uh, gravity is, of course, based on mass. You might be in some area where the, where the, uh, you know, the uh, mass underneath you is denser, or there's an iron mountain right next to you, or, or whatever. But basically, this is all physical data, typically gathered by satellites. It's going to be a grid. Yes. Yes. Ah. Uh, the. Uh, the resolution of these grid files, obviously the more uh, accurate or the, the tighter the density, the larger the grid. The, um, <clears throat> there's two uh, commonly used worldwide grid files. One is EGM, they're both called EGM 2008. One is based on a two and a half degree grid where every point is, huh? Minute, two and a half minutes, excuse me two and a half minute, and that grid file is approximately 150 meg in size. And then there's another one which is a one minute grid file, and that one is 900 meg in size. So um, the, the accuracy of, of the, uh, is dependent on which one you use and, you know, and uh, how big of a grid file you're, you're will, willing to deal with. Yes. So when you have an unknown uh, reference there, uh, aside from making some of these educated guesses, are there other tools to help figure out what coordinate system you're in and what the data is? That's why you should attend their talk this afternoon. <laughs> 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 but we'll let Melita discuss this better. The, the talk this afternoon is mainly just on transformation, so it wouldn't answer your question. Um, the Lining Up Data book by Margaret Mayer. Margaret Mayer works in technical support, so she's seen every single type of data you can come across, basically. And she talks about, okay, I've got this data, I look at the coordinates, the coordinates are this size, then I need to go down this path and try and figure it out. They're this size, I can go over this other path. So it, so it helps give you a workflow on what to do when you have this data show up and it either doesn't line up and it has a definition, doesn't line up, or it doesn't have a definition, it's not lining up. So, so she talks about both cases where it's either incorrectly defined by somebody, maybe, or whether it's just not defined at all. Um, there's, there's ways to do it, and it's easier to do it actually in ArcMap than in Pro, because you can basically take a data unknown, bring it in, and then what you do is you start setting the display to be whatever coordinate system you think it's in, and then sooner or later that data hopefully will pop into place against your base map or your other data that is defined correctly. So what you do is you allow ArcMap to, um, actually that's the wrong way, 
the data that's known will pop into place against the unknown data because ArcMap's projecting on the fly to that new coordinate system. And then once that does, then you know, hopefully, that the data frame's <coughs> coordinate system is what that unknown data is. So that's, that's the kind of trick of, of doing it this, this way. Yeah. As, a, as, yeah. as, as Boyan uh, alluded to earlier, <clears throat> if you look at your data and they're all, all your values are like less than 360, <clears throat> you can guess that this is all, it's geographic data based on degrees. Whereas if you get numbers that are in the millions, you, you can figure these are XY values, and then you've got to try to match a particular projected coordinate system to it. That's yeah, pretty can, much the first step you would do. Yeah, the, I'll, I'll get you to a second. The, the thing with that is if the data is geographic, it's de decimal degrees, it's much harder to figure out because um, you can't discern whether it's really W 84 or NAT83 or NAT27 without having pretty good data to check it against. You know, if you get, you have a decent base map that's WC84 based, you bring in NAT27 data, which is the older US datum, you're going to see the data is not going to be lining up against the streets if it's street data. But if it's newer data, it's point data, it may be difficult to tell that whether you're really in the newest NAT83 2011 or whether you're really in NAT83 from 1986 or WC84, because you might be off a half a meter or a meter. So, yeah. I can uh, get some data from a uh, physical file. <coughs> I don't know if the shape file has the code file or other things that uh, can help with the same uh, problem. In the yeah, so. I think I yeah, so, so shape files particularly will come, hopefully will come with a dot P or J file and that contains the coordinate system definition as that well-known text that we talked about earlier. And uh, and again, it can be there, but not be right. We've definitely had data come in where someone has said, oh, it's WGS84, because all my other data is WGS84, and, and it's not. It's in UTM, it's some, some projected coordinate system. And suddenly the data is showing up in the ocean, usually, somewhere, Atlantic or Pacific, or it's down at the equator or something. And, and you have to be aware of that, that yes, the data can be defined incorrectly. At that point, it, it's almost, the best thing to do is take away the coordinate system. You can clear it. You can delete the file. You can, you can actually use define projectile to clear the coordinate system. Because at that point, it's no, it's not good information. And then now that it's unknown, really the first thing to do is to look at the data, look at the coordinates, and try and figure out what does this make sense to be. Is it decimal degrees? Then I know I need to go for a geographic coordinate system. If it's projected, one thing you can do um, now in the software is you can actually try and search for the coordinate systems. So you can say, okay, this is USA data. And we will check actually the, the, the extents. Of the, we have extents in all the coordinate systems. It'll check the names of the extents and look for USA. Or, I, I, okay, what is used in Canada? You can type in Canada and it'll try and give you the coordinate systems that are used in Canada. So that'll help you also guide you to try and figure out well, what could be used if I've got Canadian data, what could the coordinate system be? Yes. Um, you Well, you can be using the same coordinate system, uh, <clears throat> but even uh, something that we didn't get into at all is is uh, is remember that that uh, basically even on a flat map we are modeling a globe. And so, for instance, the Pythagorean theorem doesn't work. You know, the, uh, the distance that, you know, if you're using a ruler on a map and trying to describe it, you know, um, <clears throat> so we have different uh, line types that we can deal with. Is it a geodesic, which is, what is the shortest distance along the surface of the Earth? Or what is a loxodrome, which is, what is, this, what is the distance along a particular meridian or a, or longitude. <clears throat> so um, all of these are, you know, various measurements are available in any coordinate system. So you don't have, you don't have to change coordinate systems to try to figure out distance. But you do have to know what you want to use this distance for. Yes, you had a question. You told us that the transformation has its own rectangle. How can we see 
Uh huh. That's a very good question. And right now, we don't have any any uh, tool that will actually show all that information. Unfortunately, that would be a pretty good tool to have to be able to look at it. Uh, a um, lot of a lot of our information comes from the EPSG registry that that Rob mentioned. Uh, the website's EPS, www.epsg-registry.org or just epsg.org will get you to like the website. Um, they, you can download polygons for everything that they define. And, they, and you can also look up stuff there. It's another good way to find out what's being used in an area because that's probably a good 80 or 90% of our data as well. Um, uh, we do have another group uh, that works with more of the apps that they're actually uh, hoping to stand up a service that actually shows all the extents and you can do searches and stuff. So we're hoping to get that up this year, but I don't have any details on that yet. Yes. Uh, like yeah, if you do it like an info on the point, it'll come up and you can change the coordinate system to different coordinate systems. I don't know. We'll have to we'll have to try and find that for you. Come come up and give me a card or take my card and we'll find out for you. Okay, and then. Yeah. Well. <clears throat> Um, <clears throat> for example, let's say you want to measure uh, what is the height of Mount Everest. Okay, um, the device that you're going to be using is essentially measuring the uh, the gravity value at that point, and then based on that, you can you can calculate what is your height. But it's your height above the gravity base, not above the ellipsoid. Which is so uh, typically when you're, you know, again, what you're doing here is, you, is you're switching between some theoretical mathematical values, which are based on our theoretical ellipsoid, and then, and then dealing with real world measurements, which are based on uh, real gravity measurements. This also comes from historically how you would measure heights is you would start off at the seashore take an average of the of the tides over 17 or 20 years or however long you had and then you would what's called leveling you would really ha take a stick someone would walk off with another stick and you would go okay how, what's the difference in height there and then you would just work your way inland from from there so that's why it's gravity related it all came back from mean sea level from some local area and then you would basically work your way inland and then finally when we started getting gravi gravimeters where you could measure the relative gravity, then you started making a change from going from mean sea level, what really is going on in, in, inland, but we don't have that direct connection to what's happening on the, on, on the, the ocean. Oh. I, will, I will just add one more thing, like um, when you, doesn't matter what kind of measurements you're doing, you're never, you're never stand like vertically, like um, directly like uh, vertically on the ellipsoid, you're always base, you're standing also, like today, when we were sitting here, we we're sitting based on the gravity. We're not sitting based on some mathematical model. So that's why, like, the heights are measured and uh, gravity related. And then, like, if you want to um, convert the data to some ellipsoid-based stuff, you need kind of this difference that you have to add. Oh yeah, GPS. GPS, like for example, GPS in general returns ellipsoidal heights um, and never returns the gravity-related heights. So um, most of the, the receive, GPS receivers, they have these gravity-related models inside already. And uh, then they were able to return you uh, the, the gravity-related height, orthometric height. But uh, if you look pure GPS data, they will always return G uh, ellipsoidal heights. Differential, well, yeah, that's definitely what it is. And you remember, it's even stranger because uh, uh, the gravity-related things, gravity doesn't necessarily go in a straight line. You know, you might be near a very dense mountain, and so gravity lines change. It's very complicated. That's why we really have to have a reference to a file that 
where someone has actually compiled this data as opposed to trying to calculate it. Yes? Yeah, so part of this is terminology. So historically, the terminology is you're on a datum. You're on a geographic datum. And, and uh, the standards organizations have started moving towards coordinate system or coordinate reference system, where the coordinate, a geographic coordinate reference system just references a, ge a geodetic or a geographic datum as part of that. So it's, de it's definitely just part of the coordinate reference system definition. And historically, there's been a lot because every country would do their own. So each country would do their own local one. They would have a local, they'd fit a ellipsoid to their area they'd, with all their data. And now suddenly when we got satellites going up, we could finally start looking at the world as a whole, figure out a world ellipsoid that fits everybody pretty good, and come up with these world geodetic um, coordinate reference systems like WGS84. And, and, even, and so, so any new datum that's coming along, new geographic coordinate reference system, is what I call Earth-centered, i.e. it fits really well with WGS84 and with the ITRF systems, which are all worldwide ones. So they're always, the newer ones are always based on this kind of worldwide system, because it's a pretty good fit now. We don't have to worry about using these old, the older local ones, because they just don't fit that well anywhere except where they were defined. Does that help? Okay, uh, I think we're running out of time. Um, you are free to stay and ask either Melita or Boyan or me any questions but uh, the rest of you are free to move about the world. <laughs> Don't forget to transform your position. Thank you. <clears throat>